Hey guys, welcome to another Ultimate Edge webinar series conversation. I'm excited about this one. An old friend of mine is with us, Anthony Iacobucci. Anthony, I go way back. He was, well, you were like the national manager or what role did you play with national credit care, Anthony? I, I actually was a regional director. I handled the Pacific okay. Northwest when we, uh, when we used to travel up in the days. I, I'd run around I-5 like a, a chicken with its head cut off when we were in <laughs> office, but uh, world's changed a little bit. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us again. And Anthony and I, uh, we've done we do credit we've done credit repair with National Credit Care for years. I reached out to him recently. He said, John, we have a whole new program now. It's really cool. And so I've learned some about it, but I'm going to learn a little bit more today. The company has evolved into a company. Anthony, I'm going to let you tell us what is the overall mission of UQAL? What's your, who's your client? What are you doing for them, please? It's been goodness almost almost 15 years since uh, we connected uh, up in uh, the Burlington area uh, that long ago. So it's uh, it's been a, quite a journey. Uh, National Credit Care was the predecessor in which uh, I worked for for near over a decade. Uh, around 2020, we were approached by a, a fintech organization called UQual, short for You Qualify, to really kind of bring us into the 21st century of financial wellness. You know, being a mortgage centric organization. We were leaving a little much, little too much meat on the bones in regards to what we can do, not only for our mortgage-centric mortgage professionals that we serviced, more importantly, the clients. So the, the UQAL platform allows us to offer more of a comprehensive, more of a robust uh, experience for the consumer that touches a lot more pain points that not only, not only the loan officers feel from, from their end getting a consumer pre-qualified, but at the same point, the clients in which we service. Good. Okay. Well, there are a lot of pain points when people are trying to get qualified and don't qualify for credit and and or other reasons. So give us a little deeper overview of here of what the program entails for someone if they wanted to sign up. Um, it, is it basically signing up through us and we send them to you and describe all of that for us, Anthony? Please. Sure. So, so really what that looks like from a handoff perspective, everything is always facilitated by our, our amazing referral partners like yourself. You know, I know that you've got fantastic industry knowledge as well as tools internally to get somebody done ASAP. But if there is a situation and in, in situation in which there is sort of a distress situation where a consumer cannot hop onto the plat or uh, come up to an immediate uh, approval, we're actually able to facilitate the, the platform. The platform is a financial wellness platform that is going to touch upon four different pillars we've identified as pain points that a consumer and a loan officer feel during the pre-approval. First, there's going to be tip of spear, which is always going to be credit. Second is going to be DTI, which is obviously the debt to income ratios. Third is going to be budgeting, helping a consumer save for a down payment. And fourth is going to be documentation procurement, or gathering the, the specific documents which we need to get the pre-approval facilitated. Okay, so I'm going to start from the back one and work that direction. So the documentation you gather sounds like it's similar documentation that we would gather for the loan application to understand income and the debt to income ratio and what they qualify for. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Our, our mantra is this. If I'm going to serve as a client for you for two, three, four, five months sometimes, if I'm not at least reminding the consumer that, hey, John's going to need you know, a W-2 or bank statements or a government ID, a copy of a driver's license, the consumer actually has the ability to gather this information as we're you know facilitating the credit on the back end and gather it into one of our fin lockers that actually can have everything housed safely and securely, and they can actually send it over to the lender uh, very clean and easy and, and on through uh, the portal in which that they'll have on our end. Okay, gosh, got it. So it's a secure online portal where they put things just like we use, good. And Anthony, is the is the crux around it by focusing on credit, improving the credit score and removing debt or reducing debt overall? Is that kind of the overall goal? Yeah, absolutely. The ability for us to take two multiple different avenues for the consumer experience, well, it's alleviating them of specific debt, paying down specific debt, exonerating them from derogatory information that's impacting the credit. The goal is this, to do everything simultaneously. And I know you and I have been doing this together for a long time, and there have been countless situations where 
maybe, hey, John, 120 days later, the client's ripping rare to go. Uh, the credit's at a 640 threshold. And you come back to us and say, Anthony, that's great. But the consumer has to wait another six months because they have to gather up enough funds to get uh, to qualify for the down payment, things okay. of that nature. The platform is geared to do everything simultaneously, whether it's gather documentation, get the DTI under control, get the credit fixed, you know, obviously get the uh, the debt utilization under control, things of that nature. The platform is made to do everything simultaneously. I got it. That works. So let's walk through this. A client comes to us, so they apply for a loan. We pull a soft pull credit report, guys, normally, because that does not impact your credit scores. But it gives us a good look at two of the credit scores and what the debt load looks like. And we see that there are issues there potentially with credit score potentially also with debt to income ratio, then what we would do is refer you over to Anthony and his team. And let's take it from there, Anthony. We we send them to you. What happens from there, please? So the handoff is obviously pretty seamless coming from our referral partners. It would go over to myself or Crystal, who's fantastic as a point of contact here internally at the office. We get the, the consumer over to one of our onboarding specialists. What we have the ability to do is help the consumer facilitate a soft pull. It's a tri-merge report. It will never adversely affect the credit score. It'll never show up in a mortgage report. What it will do, John, it will give us real-time information of what has impacted the consumer from a credit perspective. Also, the consumer also has the ability to hook up a checking or savings or credit card with the platform. What that's going to be able to do is this, which is really unique. It's going to be able to extract 12 months of transactional history the consumer has on a specific account. The AI that's built into the platform then will come up with a specific tailored plan for the consumer to help them break bad behavioral spending. So as I alluded to, yes, the credit is always going to be tip of spear why most files a mortgage professional is going to be unable to get done. At the same time, the technology, the AI that is littered throughout the platform has the ability to help break bad behavioral spending and help the consumer actually save simultaneously for a budget uh, and budget for a down payment. All right, let me pause you there for a second. AI is yeah. working here. Do they get an email or do they get a coach on, from UQOL that's talking to them or a combination of all the above? Or how, what, what's the incentive and how are they coached through this to make sure they change their spending habits? Great, 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 great question. So the technology works hand in hand with one of our onboarding specialists. When they're, when they're referred over to the UQOL platform, we give anywhere from a 15 to 20 minute consultation of exactly what's obstructing them from a credit perspective, because we have the ability to pull that credit report. Then the AI takes over in regards to a specific behavioral strategic plan to help them budget money. That AI will then text message and email them specific tasks that he cool. or she needs to do. Yeah, it's one of those situations where it's like this. When a borrower might have just some aberrations that need to be cleaned up, maybe we can identify the consumer spending $417 a month on Starbucks. Or he or she has $213 a month in applications on their phone. Or the client that's spending six dollars $700 on Grubhub. If I can identify where we can kind of nip that stuff in the bud and allocate those funds towards a down payment, simultaneously correcting the credit, well, then now we have the down payment. Now we have the credit fixed and we're able to move forward with, with the pre-approval. Okay. Let's talk about credit for a second here, Anthony. That's always a big thing we get a lot of questions on. Um, different credit models and all of that. Let's speak to that. What models are available and what, how are they different and what should a client be aware of there? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is understand that you're getting a FICO algorithm. Two, four, or five is predominantly used in the mortgage industry. What a lot of people see nowadays is a Vantage score. And I want to touch upon that for a second because the misinformation that is getting diluted down to the consumer before they even speak to a trusted mortgage professional. They're going to a credit karma. They're going to a score sense and getting misinformation from a Vantage scoring model. And just for the, the, the viewers to understand the credit score in which, for example, you get from Credit Karma, it will oftentimes mirror what a mortgage professional is going to pull. What is not in what is not accurate, what is not verifiable is going to be what is calculated from a score perspective. For example, Credit Karma will show you the medical collections in which you have, the late payments in which you have that are older than two years old. But the scoring mechanism through the Vantage model they use does not calculate medical debt and does not calculate late payment history that's older than two years old. So on the mortgage side, 
you guys want a snapshot of what's happened in the last seven years. Credit right. Karma is only saying, hey, we only care about what's happened in the last two years. And oftentimes it's setting up a false sense of hope for the consumer because they think they Credit Karma said I'm pre-improved. Let me go to John and his team and finding out it's actually quite the opposite. Got it. Okay. And what things, what's the major predominant things that you find that people need to do with their credit to improve their credit score, Anthony? <clears throat> Good question. I think twofold. One, first and foremost, is where to carry your credit card balances. There's so much misnomers out there. I yeah. will debunk that for you right now. The sweet spot to carry your balance limit ratio is 6%. It doesn't mean that you can't run the cards up. It's just when it comes time to report, make sure that you're paying those balances below 6% and never carry a zero, meaning that the algorithm doesn't like dormancy. Oftentimes they're they're kind of tricked by that zero dollar balance that a consumer, you know, obviously carries month over month. So that's the first thing to avoid. The second, I've, what I'm seeing a lot of people now is they're compromising their length of history. And this is a sneaky one because it's not picked up on traditional simulators that most mortgage companies use. Length of history is about a 15% component of your credit score. We're living in a world in which credit card miles, airline miles, there's so many different bells and whistles from credit card offerings. We're seeing right. consumers shut down old established accounts and chasing the newest airline miles or the rewards or the, the, the Centurion, the, uh, the Chase Sapphire, things like that to get better, you know, obviously personal rewards. But what they're doing is compromising the length of history in which they've established with older cards, with older accounts. So, for example, you might have a client that's work walking around with a credit card from Wells Fargo that's been open for 10 years. The limit's fine. The balance is fine. There's no bells and whistles. And he or she sees a commercial for United and go get a United credit card and get 50,000 miles to start. Well, they shut down that Wells Fargo card, and then they just lost 10 years of payment history and to start anew through that United, uh, that United credit card. Oh, my. That's a big tip, guys. Keep yeah. those cards. So is there an optim optimum number of cards versus, and also the balance between revolving debt and installment debt? Anthony, speak to that. Please. Sure, absolutely. So we like to have a nice mix overall, but usually no more than three revolving accounts. The algorithm is maximized at three at three credit cards. The reason why we don't advise more, well, it's, it's, it's kind of juggling a hand grenade, right? Because when you start opening so many different various credit cards, there's annual fees that come up. There might be a, a, a reporting date in which that you miss. And then all of a sudden you can see that 30 day late payment hit your credit profile and lose a hundred points, mainly because you're juggling too many. So we found that three is optimal um, in regards to installments. The great thing about installment loans, which everyone should understand, the balance limit ratios does not affect the credit score. For example, if you get a half a million dollar loan on a mortgage, well, you owe a half a million dollars that first month uh, on plus interest. Um, so you can't pay down those balances on installments. We advise our clientele most of the time to just make the agreed upon payments, whether it's on an auto loan, uh, an installment loan, such as a student loan, things like that. You're not getting any benefit by paying it off faster. Okay. Good to know. Um, what is the, when, when you say people need to play down the credit card and they get it to the 6%, how long does it take for their credit score to react to that? It's usually month over month. And the great thing, you can really identify the actual specific date. All you have to do is flip over the back of a credit card, ask the servicer when they report those balances to the repositories, and then just make sure you're paying off that card before that. And the problem that a lot of people fall into this bucket is that we live in a procrastinating kind of society, meaning that if the bill's due on the 15th, I'm going to set up my automatic withdrawal or make my payment on the 15th. Credit card companies are very smart and saying, hey, we understand most people will pay on the dates and what in fact do. We're going to report the credit card balances on the 7th, the 8th, the 9th. What we've taught our clientele over the years is simply flip over the back of the credit card, call the customer service department, ask when you report to the credit bureaus. If it's the 8th, then instead of paying the credit card on the 15th, we're going to pay it on the 7th, make sure we're maximizing those balances and maximizing our credit score month over month. That's a good tip. So, Anthony, let's say we have the client that's got three, four, five credit cards, they're all maxed for whatever reason. They have the ability to pay them all down to 10% or below the magical 6% number. They 
call on the back, they find out when they're gonna report, they get them all paid down prior to them reporting. So the next reporting cycle, the credit bureau is gonna see low balances on all those credit cards. Does the score jump up um, automatically to the maximum then, or does it take a month or two for it to see if it's gonna stabilize there? It, it'll jump up month over month to the max of the revolving debt component of the credit score, which is about 30%. So you will ultimately maximize that 30% of the scoring model by just making sure those balances are below 6%. Obviously, there's okay. other components and, and variables that come into the score, but from a credit from a credit card perspective, which is debt utilization, 30% of the credit score, that will be maximized by doing that, that simple trick. Yeah, that's almost a third of the impact of your credit score. So yeah. let's speak to the others. What are the other components of the credit score model that impact score, Anthony? Yeah, another component is going to be 10% of the score, which is going to be a nice mix of accounts. This kind of comes in, and it's actually up by you in the Pacific Northwest. We see a lot of this, the Dave Ramsey disciples, meaning that they're simply not going to have outstanding debt. They're not going to have auto loans. They're not going to have credit cards. You know, they're going to live in a cash kind of world. Well, as we know, cash is kind of king. So the algorithm that that is specific for mortgage lending, approved by Fannie and Freddie, they want a nice mix of accounts. They want to see a couple credit cards. They want to see an installment loan, whether it's an auto loan, something of that nature. So that's 10% of the credit score. Another 10% of the credit score is new credit. That's actually the inquiries in which the consumer takes. You don't like to take a, a tremendous amount of inquiries in a small time period. Oftentimes, folks thinks it's folks thinks it thinks that it's something that's during the home buying process. I've seen most folks that are affected by inquiries. It's during when they're buying a car loan because the so consumer steps onto the car dealership, and the, that that dealer is going to to run your credit six, seven, eight times in a day. That's where you're seeing those monthly drops, 15, 20 points, because you lose about two to three points on a hard inquiry. So that's okay. something to be aware of as well. Okay. And then 35% of the score, the last 35% is going to be payment history. That's where all the the derogatory the derogatory impact information that's that's accumulated, whether it's medical bills, late payments, collections, charge offs, that's where it's all housed in that 35% of the score. Okay, that's quite significant. So guys, two items here: payment history is 35%, credit cards 30. That's six credit cards are 30%. That is 65% of your total overall credit score with two items that you have significant control over. That's yes. that's huge. Absolutely. And I think the big thing to understand with the 30% of the scoring model, there's no wealth bias in credit scoring. So if you don't think if you're responsible enough or you don't feel comfortable having a big limit of a credit card, a $300 credit card and a $30,000 credit card, they weigh the same in the eyes of the algorithm. It's the balance limit ratios that are affected on the score. So if you're a consumer out there and maybe you're apprehensive to open a credit card, get a small $300 credit card, hook it up to a subscription like a utility bill or a netflix account or a gym membership something that's going to you know trans everything something that's going to run every 30 days good so you're you're building up your credit score and paying your regular bills all at the same time yes sir yes that's good is that part of what you teach people when they come through the uqual program anthony yeah most definitely i mean good credit health uh is something that we really strive because ultimately there's only so much the platform and even our coaches can help at a credit bureau level in regards to you know, incorrect or misreported information. 65% of the scoring model is something that a consumer with the right coaching and handholding can optimize on their own accord, you know, like paying things on time, maintaining low credit card balances, low inquiry impact, things of that nature. All right. And so one more thing on credit, uh, how long typically do people la take in the program before they see a significant rise in their credit score? And what is a significant rise? What can they expect when typically when they come to the program? Sure. Good question. It, it, it always really varies per file. Sometimes some consumers see tremendous impact and in, in score increase in 30 days because there's some balances that have shifted. Some accounts have been corrected and alleviated off the profile. So it really kind of varies from month to month, uh, not only on a consumer file, but really on a file for each person. And everybody's credit report, everyone's credit rating is kind of like a fingertip. It's a fingerprint. It's unique to them. So it's tough to, oh, yeah, that's probably the number one question we get, right? It's like, how long is it going to take? And yeah. when can I get back on the driver's seat? It really kind of varies. Uh, but the great thing about the platform 
from a transparency perspective is the consumer has the ability to refresh a credit report in their portal every 30 days. So the consumer will always understand where they're at at that moment in time because we're able to facilitate that TriMerge credit score. So the consumer pops in there if they choose to do so every 30 days and they can update their scores and see them right there. Yes, sir. Yep. They just click a button, seven seconds, you got a brand new credit report at your fingertips. And that's the credit scores that we're going to see as the mortgage person as well, correct? It's We're currently working on a Vantage model, so they are a little bit inflated, uh, okay. but we are in testing to get mortgage FICO scores rolled out probably by the fall, which is really exciting because not, not only do our reports now currently mirror what a mortgage professional pulls, but actually then soon be told the score will actually mirror exactly what you guys pull as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really, really yeah. good. Um, so how frequently do does the AI talk to them and encourage them? And what's the what's the feedback they get as they're going along while they're building building a down payment because they're getting their debt load under control and get and improving on the credit card balances all at the same time? What's the what can they expect for feedback in, in a live coach versus the AI? Sure. The AI is going to talk on a weekly basis. It's going to give congratulatory text message or emails if a consumer does something right. It will give reminders if a consumer hasn't jumped on something, for example, as like allocating money towards the down payment, the down payment bucket, or if they have an open and secured credit card, which is recommended because the AI will track inquiries and it will let the consumer know, hey, you know, you still have to get that secured credit card open. There's a weekly kind of text message and email conversation. And then from a live person perspective, there are monthly conversations in which we have with the consumer. We just need to get the consumer to actively participate by refreshing that credit report in their portal so we can have a, a comprehensive, more of a holistic conversation in regards to what has happened month over month from the old report to the new report. All right, cool. So we talked about budgeting. We talked about building a down payment while they're budgeting. We talked about credit, which is central to everything. What other features do you want to talk about, Anthony? Anything else that goes on here? <clears throat> I think the DTI simulator uh, is something that we're really proud about. Uh, it's not as sophisticated as maybe one that you use on the mortgage side, but we have an elementary DTI simulator built into the platform where a consumer can actually look at what the ratios look like, you know, based upon the assets and liability from the credit reports that we pull, plus some basic information like how much money do you make annually? Um, what do you have saved? Things of that nature. So instead of just kind of hyper-focusing on the credit, we're actually able to identify specific scenarios where we can help them maximize their DTI, whether there's a, a repossession that has occurred or charged off credit card, things of that nature, where we can s slowly hone in on specific accounts that we might need to get rectified uh, to make sure the DTI is not out of whack. Okay. And I'm anticipating that the feedback to the mortgage professional to us here is going to be the similar what we had with National Credit Care, which was quite frequent as much as we wanted. How does that work? Yeah, the great thing with our communication to you is this, is that for the first time, the updates that you get from us are going to be comprehensive deletions and quantitative score increases because I'm able to actually take the different credit reports and put them side by side. So the only thing the consumer actually needs to do is make sure that they're updating it regularly on, on their end because there is a level of compliance that the consumer needs to do every 30 days. And like I said, it is pretty easy. They can log on their portal click a button and seven seconds, get a brand new credit report at their fingertips. Then that'll trigger <laughs> really us cool. to kind of, yeah, it's beautiful, right? And that triggers us to give us, a, give them a con, uh, gives us a trigger to reach out to them for a consult, to get them up to speed of exactly what's going on with the file. And then we're able to facilitate the update with you. All right. And I know the question burning on uh, all of our clients minds right now and our YouTube audience is what does it cost to get into this program? Anthony? Sure. Sure. All of your clientele um, has always been set up as a preferred vendor, especially the ones that watch the YouTube channel. Instead of $199 to get going, it's only $99. And then every 30 days of participation thereafter is $129. There's no tax, no hidden fees. There are also no contracts. It is a month-to-month -month service because, again, we don't know how long a consumer really needs to be with us. If they need to get to that 620, it happens in 90 days. Fantastic. Cut loose. If it's a client that's in a truly distressed situation, they have to be on board six, eight months. He or she can be on the board six, eight months. It's just, it's up to the consumer on how long they want to participate. All right. And the stress guys, you're not going to call Anthony um, directly and his uh, assistant, Crystal, who's awesome, by the way, Anthony, you're not going to chat with her. We, what happens is you go to the mortgage professional. In this case, you're going to call myself or Marsha. 
We're going to chat with you, see if you need credit repair. Maybe you need some counseling on budgeting. The reason I really like this program is because we tend to do the same thing, but now we have a buddy called Anthony and his crew that do it in conjunction with us so it doesn't drop through the cracks. It's easy for that to happen. So we really like the fact that they're going to be helping us with that. We will refer you to them. Because of the referral, you get that extra special pricing that Anthony just talked about. Thanks so much for that, Anthony. We appreciate it. Yeah. Any closing comments or anything, Anthony? Yeah, I, I'd like to to kind of leave everyone with this. Uh, financial wellness is at its most volatile state. There, with hyperinflation, with rates the way they are, not only on the mortgage side but every other facet of life, it is more imperative than ever to have all your ducks in a row, all your T's crossed, all your I's dotted from a credit perspective. You know, to achieve financial freedom, I think is very much a cliche nowadays. This platform helps the consumer do that. I think far too often are we just using those you know, cliche terms like financial freedom. Financial freedom is not paying 27% interest on a credit card. Financial <laughs> freedom is not paying 29.5% on an auto loan. Financial freedom is getting access to 0% financing and the best interest rates a mortgage professional has to offer, not just getting by by the skin of your teeth, because that's where the predatory natures of, of credit cards and servicers and interest rates, that's where it starts. Someone with a 780 credit score, they're not getting predatory. It's the folks that are on the precipice of approval at a 589 or a 553 or a 605. They're the ones that get stuck in this vicious cycle they can't get themselves out of. Not because they don't want to, but the system is built against these folks to gouge them with interest rates. So it might not be the best time to buy for a specific service for the person in this certain scenario, but it's always a good time to make sure that you, know, you do have good credit health and do and do have good financial wellness because you don't know when, hey, you might drive by the dream house and you want to get a pre-approved for it, or your car might break down and you have to get the kids to school and get to work and get to church. And all of a sudden you're paying an exorbitant amount on an auto loan. So uh, I, we're really trying to preach, you know, financial wellness more than we ever have in the past. Absolutely. And as you know, guys, working with us, one of our goals is to help you build wealth with real estate if that's what your desire is. The number one wealth generation tool in the United States, according to most studies, is real estate. If you take a look at someone who wants to be a renter and there's nothing wrong with renting a property and some people should not be homeowners because it just doesn't fit their lifestyle or their mentality and it's just fine. If you want to build wealth, real estate is a great asset and tool to do so and there's great ways to do it. And to piggyback on what Anthony was just saying there, the credit card debt in the United States right now is at an all-time high, given what the Federal Reserve has shown us recently. And so we'll take a look at what we call your blended household rate, which means, yeah, you might have a mortgage at 3 or 4%, but you have all this other credit card debt aside at the 20% range that Anthony was mentioning there that causes your blended rate to be much, much higher. It may make sense to actually refinance that loan with a HELOC potentially, or maybe with a new first mortgage and take care of that debt and get it under control that way. And then don't do it again, you know, keep that debt under control. That's that's how wealth is built. Anthony, we appreciate your time today. Marsha's adding to this conversation, saying excellent information. Anthony and his team are amazing and have been extremely helpful to my client. Oh, one question for Anthony. It sounds like there's another question coming your way, which I'm sure will be good. Um, so again, guys, if you want to if you want to reach out and get in contact with Anthony and his crew and just find out what they can do for you, it's not like you have to go through the loan application process and all that. Contact us. We can put you in contact with them, and then we'll work together to help you with your situations. Um, question for you, Anthony. Do HELOCs on a credit report score the same as a revolving account? So if they have high balances on HELOCs, is that a problem? It's it's such a good question, uh, and really, quite frankly, it comes down to the servicer who's servicing the HELOC. There's two different ways it could be coded. Most HELOCs are coded as MTG, as a mortgage product. We have seen folks, unfortunately, whether it's maybe it's a smaller credit union or a, small, a smaller banking uh, institution, that they've actually coded the HELOC as a, as a revolving account, which, again, ultimately it is at the end of the day. It's a credit card. Um, the important thing to understand is, yes, Marsha, it will look maxed out. That's the importance of actually having two or three other credit cards open because every card weighs the same. So if you have two or three other credit cards that are open, it's not 30% of your credit score the HELOC's affecting. It's only affecting 10%. 
because every card weighs the same. So I've had clients actually take out a HELOC. It looked like it was a revolving account. It looks like it was maxed out. We advise the client to open up two or three more credit cards, small balances, <laughs> and it kind of makes it look like it's you know only really impacting one trade line. So yeah, it's, it's it should be coded as a mortgage product, but sometimes it doesn't. That's a really technical question. That's a great one. As usual, Anthony, great information for us and for our clients on how you can optimize your credit score, guys, which means optimizing your interest rate as well. And that's great. Um, our YouTube channel, guys, I would suggest that you forward this particular one to anybody that you know that needs to know a little bit more about optimization to prepare for a home purchase, credit included and all of that. Certainly subscribe. Comment down below if you're on the YouTube audience. We're happy to answer those comments. And we might have to get um, Anthony back with us another to dig a little deeper in some of these topics because it was really good. Absolutely. Anthony, as always, I thank you for your time, my friend. Thank you, John. Good talking to you guys. Marshall, great hearing from you. All right. Talk to you later, guys. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.